Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And today we're going to show some love to the rhythm section. I have one of the most beloved and talented bass players out there with Jurgen Carlson, from most well known from Government Mule. Uh, he's had a ton of other bands, and we'll talk about them. Great bass player, great guy. He's a lot of fun. Uh, and so I want to just give a quick shout out to our mutual friend, John Paterno. John, thank you for hooking us up. We appreciate it. John produced the new Mule album that's coming out. And uh, all right, Jurgen, originally from Sweden, most well known, as I said, as the basis of Government Mule since 2008. He's also a successful multi instrumentalist, producer, mixer, and composer. He's a founding member of the rock band Planet of the Apps, also known as POA, uh, and he's worked on every creative level of that recording process, those two albums. If you're not familiar with Planet of the Apps, it's ABTS, like Mad Apps last night. Two amazing records, man. I, I really love In fact, those are my ringtones off this That's first kidding. album. No, I'm serious. Yeah. Those are, like my wife's ringtone is uh, the real, I forget the song. Yeah, I love that. That whole record was both those records are great. Uh, also, he was a member of the hard rock fuzz band Nine Chambers, along with the uh, original Monster Magnet guitar player Ed Mundell, who was on this show a while back. Jurgen and his wife, Minnie Diaz, also have a really cool alternative band called Little Days. They've released two albums and a bunch of singles. If you like really good music and melodic but ass-kicking songs, I'd encourage you to check all of those bands out. He is currently living in Los Angeles, and he is the co-owner of the world famous Rogers Boat Studio with British engineer Steve Holroyd. Did I miss that name? Was that right? Well, he is no longer in the studio. He, uh, I bought him out, or he retired basically uh, three, four years ago, five years ago. Okay. Who's is there? Any, is this? It's just your show now. It's just me. All right. There you go. You only have to make the check did, out to one person. Just about everything. Very cool. Well, man, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming on the show. That's what we do. Three times <laughs> in your lifetime. <laughs> All right. So I have to ask you most of these questions. I hope you'll never have asked before. Some of them you will. And I apologize in advance. Uh, where did you, what, where did you grow up in Sweden and what kind of like what city or town was it? Was like a big city or a small farm area or. Well, it was sort of from the outside, you could say it's a suburb to Gothenburg, but when you live there, it's a city proper. It's called Trollhättan, And that's where they, uh, built Saab, the car that's no longer. Oh, yeah. That's what it's known for. That's oh, cool. Yeah. So I actually worked at the Saab factory for four days. That was all you could take, or they fired yeah, you? Yeah, then I called out sick for a week. You know, <laughs> socialistic system, you can call out a week with 80% 80, 80 pay. Four days after you start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So then I worked three more days and called out sick. And then my, um, I guess you'd call it foreman or whatever. He called me in and he said, man, you gotta, you gotta put in some effort here. And then, you know, in three, four years, you'd be in my position. You, you can... <laughs> and I just looked at him and walked out and never came back. Good for you, man. That being said, I think a bunch of people are going to move to Sweden now. That's pretty cool benefits. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I've been thinking about moving back partially at least. Have yeah. To. If I, if I can. And it's, uh, it's what's the kind of medicine is it? Socialized medicine? Yeah. It's Medicare for all. That's as, wonderful, man. As it should be here. Yeah. That's wonderful. Uh, what were you doing in Sweden musically before you came to the States and what prompted you to come over here? Well, I had a friend that went to MI in 1986, Ulf Hogberg, and uh, he came back. And it was a big deal, you know, a guy been in Los Angeles for uh, for about a year and it was just, and he put, he wanted to put a trio or quartet together when he came back. And I ended up being the bass player with another drummer that fits into the story a little bit later. And yeah, so he, he just gave us all these charts. We had to learn Steve Moore songs and John Schofield shit. And Holy crap. I mean, I just played bass for a couple of years, you know, back in 80s, 88. I started playing bass in 86. I played on other instruments prior to that, but so it was, it was crazy. But that's, that's where it all started, the, uh, the whole series about playing and about moving to LA maybe one day. So seeing that your, this, your buddy did it, you were like, well, why can't I do it? Yeah, he didn't move here or there from there, uh, but he'd been here, you know, 
he went to school and so that was my only plan to go to school for a year and just get a speed up sped up process or get going you know reading and playing some jazz music i wasn't really into jazz i was more into pop music but i thought get a jazz background wouldn't hurt right when when what did you what was finally the thing that pulled the trigger that made you come over here i couldn't find anything in sweden that i actually went back to school there's uh, my whole base junior high and high school and it never happened really for me i ended i went seven and a half years in school and i was thrown out because i was crazy wow really yeah uh, uh i worked what were you doing i mean if you're comfortable what were you like what was the crazy what did you do I just couldn't take any directions from any authorities. I was flying my own ship at an early age. I'm not saying it was a good thing, but it was uh, that's what was going on. So instead of school, I ended up working at a record store, which was a good thing because right. I met some cool people. They introduced me to other music. Pink Floyd was one of them that kind of set me on a different course from uh, hard rock and all that stuff. But yes, yeah, so I, I actually... I think I was 18 or 19. I wanted to go back and redo junior and high school and just in a, in a, in a quick course over two years. And it started pretty good. I did six months, seven months. And uh, same thing there. I started playing cover bands on the side. I felt behind on my uh, homework and shit. And the principal called me in and said, listen, we're going to have to step up, step on the gas here a little bit. And he told me this story. I've told it before. I have a son, you know, he, uh, he's, he plays guitar and, but when he studies, he puts the guitar on the shelf and he tinkles on the weekend. And that's all I needed to hear. When I heard it like that, I just said, thank you. And I walked out and I never went back to class after that. And I called my dad and I said, we, we got to make this happen. Got to get the financial aid. We got to get this thing rolling. I, I need to leave. I need to go. And what did your dad say? Okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah, he he heard me. So he want they he was really supportive of your desire to play music. Yeah, that's almost, real. Almost a hundred percent, you know, for sure. That's the number one um, thing that every yeah you know, I pay eight hundred fifty guests on here. That's the number one thing that successful musicians have in common. Their parents were supportive of them, even if some of them had reservations, like well maybe you need a plan B. They were supportive and encouraging. Yeah, there's no plan B ever for anybody that kind of that are able to make a living on music. There's never a plan B. Yeah. Not really. Not really. Because right. if you have a plan B, you never you don't do the canned food for the seven years or whatever it is you need sure. to do, Right? Yeah. Because you don't have a choice. Right. No, that's the parents are, are, are encouraged say you should have a plan yeah, B. But well, yeah, you're right. Nobody has a plan B. But I think that's like that with everything. If you're hell, hell bent on doing something, it's like, and you're willing to do the work, you don't even think about a plan B. Right. Yeah. But it, it does feel good to have some support from home. You know, you can always call, I guess, if there was any financial, hey, I need 500 bucks. Yeah. You needed that last month too. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's like a pattern. <laughs> so how old were you when you finally moved here? I was 20 when I came to school, Los Angeles, Grove School of Music. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was a really good school. We were looking at MI and all that stuff, but it looked a little too hard rock and Sunset Strip, which it was. Nothing wrong with that. But, you know, they had good teachers there as well. But for some reason, Grove just felt a bit more serious. Yeah. I'm trying to think yeah. who I had on the show that went to Grove. Um, uh, Levitt. Levy, Adam Levy, I think went to Grove. Maybe. Levy. You know him? Uh, no, Adam Levy. He's a guitar. He's a little older. He's a guitar player out in uh, in LA. But there's hundreds of guitar players, but yeah. Um, okay, so you go to Grove School of Music. What uh, were you, are you playing at the time? Oh yeah. Well, you mean out in the city? Yeah. Like, I mean, how did you like you you came here, you didn't you didn't know anybody, right? Oh, dude, I was I was green as a leaf, just saw the palm trees and it ended up, I ended up coming with a drummer, Peter Smith, that was the drummer in that original band with the guy that went to MI in 86. Ulf. Ulf, yes. Ulf. And then, yeah, so me and Peter just um, just got off on LAX, saw the palm trees, and was like, fuck, we're here. Yeah. 
the cab into the valley and we said just uh, any hotel in the valley the valley of san fernando valley in los angeles right. and so there we were what was jackets. what was the biggest cultural shock or cultural differences you had to get used to <sighs> well everything it's it's very different just ordering at, at a restaurant you know i i I couldn't get the words for for a napkin. I called it a paper, and they said, "Do you need a pen with that?" They're like, no, um, toilet paper. I said, <laughs> "Oh, you mean a napkin?" Oh. And, then the whole, and then the whole thing with soup, super salad. I thought they said a super salad. Oh, soup. But how would you know? You how, what, what was your how how was your English? You, you didn't. No, it's good. It's good. It's mandatory from third grade. Not that I went to school very much, but as I said, but uh, yeah, no, all TV. There's no overdub in Sweden, so this. Oh, only- so you forced to learn it? Yeah, it's subtitles. Okay. So everybody speaks English. In Sweden. Okay, pretty good. Um. Okay, so you're here. You're in school. Did you get through Dick Grove? I did, just barely. My my wow. good teacher Joel De Bartolo. Um. Anyways, back to the uh, the culture thing. You know, with the Thousand Island, all the dressings, all that shit is crazy. You know, just sit there. I just want to order some eggs and you know toast come on okay. oh there's too many choices here so yeah. many compared yeah right right that's a problem in general yeah yeah it's but a problem you- even for people here because they're like um you know it's like 20 minutes to make up your mind what the fuck you want to have for breakfast yeah right mm-hmm. toast thank you yeah okay so you finished school you're starting to play gigs around town did you get in did you like connect with anybody that ultimately sort of gave you a break well, that's the weird one. It goes kind of slow. I At the end of school, I started to play with this um, singer that used to, he just, he got fired from Toto. He was with Toto for a while. For yeah. A year, John Michelle Byer, and I got this local gig down on Ventura Boulevard playing every Friday. And I, I met a lot of people through that gig because a lot of people came in, and sat in and, and it was, I learned a lot because we didn't know any other songs and you had to just learn them on stage, basically. Right. I think from originals to uh, a lot of originals to covers. He was crazy, but, you know, he was good. <laughs> good well, for me at the time. Did you, uh, I just want to skip backwards. I'm sorry. I meant to ask you, did, did you ever see Gilmore or, or Pink Floyd? Yeah. Really? Uh, well, what do you mean? Did I see them in LA or did I see them? No, did you see them in concert? Did you ever see them in, in a con- like in, in uh, Europe or something or anywhere? Yeah, sure. I mean, Pink Floyd was 1987, I think it was. It could have been 86. That must have been 87, the Moment Your Lapse of Reason tour. They, they didn't play in Sweden that time, but um, they played in Oslo, Norway. And I just um, decided to go. So I stopped I ran out in the street and stopped my friends and said, hey, let's go to Oslo. And they were like, oh, okay. So we just drove <laughs> to Oslo. We didn't have any tickets. And then uh, scalped some tickets. And That's got- really cool. Yeah, and it, it was M- Machan Taylor singing background vocals for Floyd then. And she is... She's married to Danny Lewis, the keyboard player in, in Government Mule. So oh, I met, that's interesting. met her a little bit later, and I was like, wow, shit. So that was fun. That's wild. It's a small world, isn't it? Yeah. Holy crap. That's a, that's a wild story. Um, all right. So I'm going to ask you about some projects that you've worked on. I am not just, this is for the listeners. I'm not going to ask Jurgen about government mule. There's like a lot of interviews out there and he's been asked those questions a hundred times. So I'm going to just try to make it a little more interesting for you. Uh, nine chambers. I was curious how you connected with Ed and what made you put that project together? Well, I didn't put it together and it, it came through government mule because Greg Hampton was a good friend of Warren Haynes and Greg used to show up to the gigs early on and with mule 2008, 2009. And since he was a native LA guy, he uh, tried to pull me in there. And the, uh, the thing that sold me was when he said Vinny Apice was going to play drums. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm a big, big Vinny fan. I used to think he was, I still think he's one of the best rock drummers of the second generation after yeah. Ian Pace and Bonham and whatnot. But yeah, so that was, that was the trigger. 
And then I met Ed after the fact, when we got into the studio. Hmm. It's this cool dude, right? Yeah, I had both those guys on the show, actually, Vinny and Ed. So it was pretty cool. Yeah, it, was, it. It, was, it, was, it was with Vinny, I was, I'm not a guy that gets starstruck, but I was like, fuck it, this guy played on like my, the best out, Mob Rules, man. I was just like. One of my favorite records of all time. It's a perfect record. Perfect. I love yeah. the sound on it too. It's just so dark and just punchy. Martin yeah. Birch produced, engineered. Great record. Fuck, man. Um, what was that experience like? That I mean, how, was that? It was kind of like short lived. I, like I was hoping another record. Were you guys just in the middle of other projects at the time? We did record a second thing. It never came to fruition. Me and Greg used to disagree on most things. Unfortunately, I love him as a guy, you know, it's yeah. just deal with music. It's he wants to do a certain way and I want to do it another way. And it's his band. So he was the keyboard player or singer. Greg Hampton, he, he co-wrote all the songs, played guitar and uh, sang. Is the okay. So let me ask you this. Is that residual from the, you know, you said you didn't get along well. Is that the authority thing like with school? I don't think so. No, it, okay. It's just sometimes it just doesn't seem like the right, right thing to do, mm. for whatever reason. No, I get it. Uh, let's talk about POA, Planet of the Apps. You and Matt, drummer from Mule, put that together. How did that come about? And uh, man, I had never heard, and I have to be honest, I I wish I had heard more of T Bone Anderson. What a great player. Yeah, so roll back to orientation week at the Saab factory, my home. <laughs> he said he he's sitting in the same room and we're just looking at each other. We both got a little bit semi long hair and what was I, eighteen or something, maybe seventeen, and he was a year older. And then we both looked at each other and it's like, "Hey, man, you want to go for a smoke, cigarette? Oh yeah, let's go." And we both walk outside and nobody has cigarettes. <laughs> So that's how that started. And then we we started a Jimi Hendrix trio in Sweden, just playing with that same drummer, Peter, that later came with me to the States. And it was crazy. He set his guitar on fire. And then he's like, fuck, man, I don't want to ruin my only guitar. So he he put his shoes on fire instead. <laughs> <laughs> but it was pretty badass. I mean, we were just fearless fearless just went through and, and we didn't copy like karaoke style we copied the essence of the songs with hendrix and then we did our own thing I'm not saying it was better or anything but i'm saying that was a good thing that we yeah did. totally so the whole improv thing started early with that and black sabbath to the early improv in the in the solo sections although tony Iommi eventually ended up composing and repeating his solos the, the rhythm section is always improvised love that shit yeah so do i i'm a big saba fan mm -hmm. what uh so is, is t-bone a guy in sweden or is he here in la i've he never here in la now but yes back then he came a little bit later mid 90s i came okay. in 1991 when i was 20 you asked that before but we got hung up there somehow and, so. okay and so what so what made you think of him because there's so many players here are you just you felt the vibe was like, okay, when this feels like when we played that Hendrix trio. Well, the, the plan was since I had a studio here, I wanted to just do a project of calling a drummer and a guitar player trios or a drummer keyboard player or just some acoustic and maybe make a record with a bunch of different people. That was the original idea. And so the first guys that I called was Matt so I was touring with him, Government Mule, and we we had a really cool thing together. He's like the best when it comes to Mitch Mitchell, Ginger Baker shit, man. He's unbeatable. It's crazy. And I thought T-Bone would be um, just the right motherfucker for this thing. He was. Yeah. So I met T-Bone the, the night before, and we just flushed through some ideas, but we left it open for Matt to contribute and everybody and we just, we hit two songs the first day, dress, Dressed Up Looking Fine, I think it was called, and then Planet Part One. And, the, you know, we struggled with the name and stuff like that. But anyways, it was so much fun 
and it just clicked on all on all aspects in all aspects that we just said fuck it let's do a whole record it's such a i just wanted to look up the record the song is uh <clears throat> deep into self trying to be myself and deep into self those are such great anything you want i mean and then the second album the whole i mean it's, i wish i would have heard album. i'm very i'm very excited about the second record the first record was good for what it was you know but it was a lot of alcohol and um, stuff like that i barely remember recording it hmm. so fucked up it was fun though they say <laughs> supposedly <laughs> from what you hear <laughs> but the second one the second album's great man i just yeah. listened re-listened to it the other day because you know i knew you were coming on and i just wanted to take a spin it's awesome second record i i engineered a lot on that my my friend steve was fading out at that time the studio partner steve holroyd he's a great engineer but he was taking another turn at that time and yes, a lot of effort was was put into the second record. We focused a little bit more on the lyrics, just a little bit, not too much. But yeah. I love that band, man. Uh, when did you? How did you get? How did you learn engineering? Okay, so back to Grove. I, my my reading was pretty good back then, so I was hired into the play down classes for guitar players and singers and stuff. And in the engineering department, um, Mini Diaz was working as a, a teaching assistant. She had done the course the year before, but she was she was a good engineer. And That's so, how you met? Yeah, we, through the glass kind of thing. That's cool. And then she asked me out for a date. I don't buy that. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, we went to Chili's and we had coffee and I was just sweating. I was like, we got to get out of here. Got to have a beer. <laughs> and then we saw this great band called funk attack that used to hover around in la from the late 80s to the mid 90s with willie arnellis and drums and yeah it's a fantastic band but um so she taught me well later on when we started to write and stuff in the mid 90s when i got interested in writing the engineering came came at the same time so your wife taught you engineering mm -hmm. the that's cool signal flow yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I went to Chili's with my wife. That was our first date. Really? Yeah. We weren't, we didn't know it, but like, like that turned out to be our first date. We didn't go there with that intention, but, but dude, I mean, Hey, <laughs> here we are 29 years later. So something must've worked. Um, little days. That's you and your wife, man. What a great project that is, man. And I'm not just saying it to blow smoke up here. I really enjoyed it. I listened to the entire catalog, all the singles, everything, a couple of times. Great old school alternative music. Your wife's voice is just perfect for that, man. What a voice she has. I mean, yeah, super she... talented. Did you guys write together on that stuff? Oh, yeah, all the time, all the time. When I first met her, she already had a band together. They were playing around L.A., and... First time I went to see them, I, I I liked her a lot, but I was really worried because if she, if she was gonna, you know, be able to sing or something, I don't know, it would just be weird to have somebody. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna. I was wondering, like, what is that like working in a music and situation with your wife? I don't know. I mean, it's it's two different hats. I mean, we can argue here in the studio and then go and have dinner, and it's like nothing yeah, happens. Of course, yeah. You have to brush it off, but um, I mean, it's yeah. No, if somebody has an opinion, I we should go down the rabbit hole and see what's going on, but not just give up because oh, I don't want to argue. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Come on, yeah, That's yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. No, so she had a band, and I, I finally went to see it. I came at the the encore and I heard her voice, and I was just like, oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, I'm a sucker for that. I love like Abba, Karen Carpenter, Carpenters, Richard Carpenter. I love that shit. So, and she had that thing going. Um, and I guess it was like two, three years later when she got me, I wrote a bridge on a song. It's kind of like a Beatle rip off that I did, but I, I got a taste for it. Like, oh shit, this is cool. And then she taught me the engineering, the basics. And then um, we did our first record in 98. Well, we co-wrote the whole record basically together. And then that was it, the first Little Days record. Yeah. Yeah. Go around a little small analog machine. 
and then we got one of those digital thing and did one in our bedrooms in the early 2000s. We got uh, all these players. Jeff Bab Babco played on it, and uh, Babco is on that. He's on everything. Is like seven steps from Babco and Tim Lafave. Yeah, well, Tim wouldn't play on my record. Of Although, course, Will, of course not. Will Lee played on the last Little Days record. <laughs> Did he? Yeah, that was cool. But yeah, so and then she got pregnant, and we had our son in 2004, and that kind of put a halt to the whole Little Days band thing for a long time. Oh, I was wondering why that there was 17 year gap between the first and second or 18 years, something like that. And I was wondering about that. That's what happened. Yeah. So like the next one will be out before like 2034 then. Yeah. Correct. Or is that a thing? Like every 17 years we drop a record. <laughs> <laughs> like ABBA, they did 40 years now. They just released a new record. Have you heard it? I have not. Is it good? Yeah. No, I haven't checked it out. I haven't heard it. Half of it will grow on you with the, with, with time that yeah there's half of it jumps out immediately for sure um what else do you do in that band besides writing and playing bass i'm pretty and and you both co-engineer the record i'm assuming or no she's given up engineering i mean okay. she, she she assists you know with mike stands and put up stuff well on, on the bigger sessions when we track drums and stuff it's a big deal you know trying to play and um do all that and engineer at the same time. It's not not my favorite. Hmm. That's actually why I asked Will Lee to play because I had a live session here with T Bone on piano and Matt Abs on drums on one of the songs. And I just ran into Will. He was in LA and I was joking with him, hey, do you want to come and play on a song for a for for a low budget record? And he was like, fuck yeah. That's so but funny. He just showed up. That's cool. So yeah. you're do, you're you're mostly engine you're at writing and engineering on these. Yeah, but we're both writing equal. You know, she could be the main writer on the song. I go in and do like a bridge or some B sections, reharmonize and rearrange, or I can be the 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 main writer on certain songs. You know, with a little bit more crazy chords and melodies, and then she writes the lyrics and tweaks the melodies to her liking. So it's it's a fifty fifty. But I do ninety five percent of the engineering, and then, and then you mixing, sorry. mixing, and do the mix. And you have you're playing bass and guitar and keyboards, and sometimes oh, you are, that's what I thought. Yeah, I try not to, but it's like if you have a specific thing in mind, just call a great guitar player friend and go like, "Hey, man, can you play this?" It's embarrassing, you know. The guitar on that record is really solid, man. It's great. Yeah, but we had a lot of good guitar players. I didn't set out for it to be like an all-star cast, but it ended up being that on the last record, Pop and Taco. Yeah. Uh, Toshi plays on it, and Steve Lukather played on a couple of songs. Warren Haynes came in and played a slide thing on one song. And then my neighbor is Steve Ferroni. Okay, so... The drummer. Yeah, the drummer. <laughs> so we, we've been playing in other bands throughout the years. Um, and when he came and did, uh, he did the drums for one of the, or two of the songs, I, mean, I think he played on four, but I can't remember now, but I was joking with him, not joking, I said, I was thinking about Mike Campbell when I did the uh, scratch guitar for this, so he could hear the demo. Are you thinking about him? He said, well, fuck it, let's call him, he said. <laughs> <laughs> so hey. Mike Campbell came in and played on that? Yeah, he did. And That's he came cool. up with, with that. It's called "Stranger Inside" that song, and he came up with that hook like first first thing he ever played on the on the track, and then first take solos and everything. It's pretty fucking remarkable. Yeah, what song was that? "Stranger Stranger Inside." Inside. Yeah, the second song. On yep, yep. I liked uh, "Every Day" and "Less Less or More." Those are my two favorite songs on the track on the record. Yeah, it, really day. cool record. Pete Thorne played on that one. Toss Panos on drums. Very cool. Yeah, it wasn't all, you had a lot of also. What made you guys cover uh, the uh, Mr. Jones? It was a COVID thing. Meanie was walking around the house with her ukulele or something. And then she started in the event of something happened. And it's like, oh, I want to do that song. And then she, she came up with the arrangement. And then we did one of those things 
okay, we'll we'll do it. We'll film it and record it. But my thing was I wanted the filming to be the live take. So when Toss recorded the drums, he filmed it and that was the take. What you see in the, there's a video to it. So that take is actually live. And then I did the same thing with the bass and Mina did the same thing with vocals. Although we did like three passes of the vocals connected with the video and then we comped a little bit. And then the other guys sort of didn't do it. In the video, they mimed to themselves, but at least the foundation was pretty live. And uh, those last two singles, Catching Rainbows and Shine, that you released this year, are those like start of a new record? They're great. They were recorded for the first record. Uh, Shine never made it through the mixing and Catching Rainbows. I mixed and mastered, and it's actually on the vinyl version. Ah. Oh. But I, I wasn't happy with the mix, so we pulled it from the CD. It's a little easier. Vinyl is, you know, physics and stuff. Um, so I remixed it. Uh, I thought that one's, yeah, it's, I like that song. It's a great, I love those two singles. Two of my favorite tracks of all of them, actually. Roger Manning playing some beautiful shit on there. I'm so happy. <laughs> uh, now, if you want to talk about Mule, uh, if you want to include it in the answer, feel free. Uh, what would you say the top three musical experiences you've had? Well, Government Mule joining that band was huge. It set me on a new trajectory for sure. Meeting all these people, the East Coast. I mean, I never really played on the East Coast other than just touring. But getting stationed there with Mule, it was big. It was fun. Three things you say. Yes. Hmm. Um, well, with Mule, we got to play with John Schofield. We did a whole tour. The Sco Mule. Yeah. I have those, that record. It's great. Yeah. That was cool. Um, Pete Thorne dragged me in to play with Chris Cornell, a couple of gigs, which was remarkable. Yeah. It's like, uh, you feel it when you're standing on stage with a guy like that. It's pretty powerful. When he sings, it's, it, Oh yeah, it's like yeah. watch out. Is it weird when like you hear someone? Is it like do you feel even though you're on stage all the time? Is it is it almost surreal to you when you hear someone that powerful and that I'm assuming you're a fan of his, and then you're like hearing him in your monitors and you're on stage? Is that is that a surreal thing or a weird yeah. thing? Yeah, no, it, it triggers your ass to get you know to get it make it happen immediately yeah. yeah but he he was cool you know he looked over and he's smiling he, he's 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 like us he's he's a fan of music right yeah man he he can deliver for sure uh what did your parents do like what kind of work did they do in sweden oh well my dad was a demolition and <clears throat> excuse me he blew up um stuff and made gravel to build roads and all that stuff. Uh, my mom was um, secretary most of the time, 70s, you know, that was the thing. Yeah. Your accent yeah. is like so cool. It's not strong, but it's strong enough to like add character, man. I, I'm into accent. Sorry. I just, yeah. yeah. I, w I was eating dinner one time with somebody and I think it was maybe my wife and his wife was there and uh, the waiter's accent was really cool. And he goes, I said, Oh man, he's got a Lebanese accent. It's great. He goes, what do you mean Lebanese accent? He goes, you don't know what accent it is. I'm like, ask him where he's from. He goes, where are you from? He goes, Lebanon. <laughs> I love accents, man. I just think yeah. it's cool. Yeah. I, I think people from other places, I always look at it like you can teach me something. I can usually spot it if somebody's German or Dutch or Danish, Finnish or Norwegian speaking English. That is. Yeah. Right. Right. Do you know who, do you happen to know Amund Maru? Uh -uh. He's a Norwegian blues guy. Don't know. It's curious. Uh, so you were always going to be a musician or like, did you ever think maybe I should do something else? I mean, besides work and sob <laughs> <laughs> for, oh, for 11 days. <laughs> yeah. 
No, it was, I think, um, yeah, so 76, I went into my neighbor's big brother's room and uh, he played me rock and roll over and kiss destroyer. And that was it. That was it. You want, you knew right away you wanted to, that's what you wanted to do. Yeah. I begged my parents to get drums in 1977. I was seven years old and I got a snare drum and uh, just hit that fucker till the head came off. So I, I sort of started playing drums. That was it from nine till when we had to do the recorder flute in school, man, yeah. brutal, but I survived the year. And then I, you go to the music house and you have to audition for your main instrument. I knew it was going to be drums, but you had to like go and try a piano, saxophone and guitar and shit. But yeah. So I started drums. Did that help you as a bass player? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, just to, play, just to play bass is kind of weird. You need to play, um, I think drums helps for sure, but you need to play guitar or piano, something else as well. It's funny. I don't know why I remember this was many, many years ago. The first time I heard that was actually a Warren Haynes interview. He was saying, I think he played drums maybe, or he was just talking about the, it's, it's, it's such an important thing if you can play drums before you play your other yeah, instrument. Yeah, no, absolutely. A little yeah. bit of drumming never hurts. Yeah. Uh, more the better. Jurgen, low points. What were some of the low points or dark periods you've had to deal with and how did you get through them? Low points. Uh, probably like early 2000 when I started to realize that I'm just playing with all these boy bands on Columbia Records or Sony doing tours with people and I'm drinking way too much and the the highlight of the of the low points was probably my tour with Dancing with the Stars. Oh my God, what was that like? Oh, it was brutal. I mean, a friend of mine helped me out to get the gig, and I kind of let him down. I think uh, because Cause you hated it. Yeah, I hated it, and I was boozing way too much. Yeah, they, they ended up firing me, rightfully so. <laughs> uh. Well, it's good that you could take ownership of it at least. Yeah. And it, ironically enough, right after that, I was thinking, you know what? I'm going to give maybe the studio here another couple of years or five or 10 or whatever, because I love engineering and writing and arranging and all that stuff and mixing. But this touring business for other people, I mean, if Dancing with the Stars, if that's the peak of the corporate gigs and all the other touring shits that I've done, um, I don't want to do this. It's like, I'm out. And three days after, Jeff Young, a good friend of mine that I've done a couple of records with, working on a record right now, actually. He's the keyboard player in Jackson Brown's band. Good friend, Jeff Young. He's going to be, he's, they're coming here Thursday. And I know Val was kind enough. He called me up. So if I meet him, I'll make sure I tell him he said hello. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. funny. I know most of those guys. Um, what was I'm sorry. This? You, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, Jeff Young was, you were having a shit time with Dance with the Stars and then something with Jeff Young. Oh, yeah. So yeah, Jeff Jeff called me and said, hey, um, uh, do you know Government Mule? Do you know Warren Haynes? I was like, no, not really. I never heard of Government Mule, but I heard of Warren Haynes, maybe. I was never that into the Allman Brothers, or not at all, I should say, because in Sweden, it was like Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, kind of a thing, you know, Led Zeppelin, possibly. But no Allman Brothers, no Grateful Dead, nothing like that. Very limited. So he said, well, they're looking for a bass player. And I think you may be the right guy. You're just fucking crazy enough to. Uh, <laughs> and so from almost seriously thinking about maybe not tour or play anymore professionally, just do the studio thing. I go from that till playing more shows a year than I've ever done in my whole life. Uh -huh. So, well, yeah, Warren got on the phone with me and he's like, hey, if you can learn a lot of songs, 100, 200 songs. If you can learn 200 songs by Friday, you got the gig. <laughs> by summertime, he said. And this was early January, February of 2008, I think. Yeah. He said by summertime? Yeah. That's still a lot of songs. I mean, their oh, yeah. catalog is you're you're nuts. It's actually, it's actually more than that. It might oh. be 150 original, but then there's floating um, covers in different versions with depending on who's sitting in 
it's madness. Yeah. So officially I had the gig by April, May, I think. They flew me to New York and I auditioned. It was it was great. Was a lot of audi- was there a lot of people auditioning for that or just a handful or yeah, ten people. That's a big audition then. I feel bad for those other nine that had to learn <laughs> two hundred songs and <laughs> yeah, I don't know audition. I think maybe Tim LeFay might have auditioned. Hmm. Uh, Travis Carlton. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. I was so out of that loop and it was kind of fresh to me to come in. Even though I didn't know anything about the whole legacy with the Allman Brothers or Government Mule, my whole Black Sabbath improv and Jimi Hendrix thing fit fit right in. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Um, tell so, me. Yeah, so from low point, it turned into the high point. You know, I had a guest on my show one time and he said something like, uh, something like everything balances out. Don't ever worry about feeling like, you know, when you're really high, you better prepare yourself because some shit's going to happen to knock you down. And when you're really low, don't worry. Something's going to happen to pop you back up. And I think it's kind of true. I'm trying to get to the stage where like that. I don't have that much. Yeah, but that only works in hindsight. If you're trying to, oh, well, this is going to work out fine. It's like, fuck, man, I'm not sure. You know, you go down that shit. Yeah, right. Only looking I, back, you go like, oh, yeah, it kind of equals out. But Yeah, yeah. Uh, two or three best concerts that you've seen? Well, that Floyd concert that I saw it was yeah. up there. In Oslo? Fuck. Yeah. That's so cool. And my first show that I saw was Kiss in 1980 with Iron Maiden opening up, and it was the first tour with Eric Carr. They were still that's in- wild. Mm-hmm. That's got to be in there, and maybe Paul McCartney with the first tour with Brian Ray. I used to play with Brian, and he called me saying, "Man, I'm playing with Paul McCartney. Do you want to come see the show?" It's like, let me think. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing, amazing show. Where did you see uh, Made Note for Kiss? I think you said it. At- Gothenburg, Sweden. Oh, oh, in Sweden. 1980, October 10th. Get out of here. Remember the... Yeah, well, I can't forget that. The day. That's pretty cool. Uh, any cool or interesting stories about how you acquired any of your bases? I'm not that guy. I don't really know. I mean, I play all kinds of bases. It's hanging on the wall here, but I don't really... Well, actually, there was a government mule fan that that had that 67 EBO Gibson bass. It's hanging on the wall there. And he's like, I think you should have this. Wow. And I was like, I played it, and I told him, I think so, too. <laughs> then it's actually another Epiphone hanging there on the wall. Westmere or something, it's called. Somebody else told me, I think you should have this. And then he recorded it, and it sent, it sent a little copy of the recording over to me and i was like yeah you're right i need that that's, that's pretty cool people give you basses fans that's well they amazing. don't give it i have to pay for, <clears throat> pay for it but um it's a good good deal yeah usually that's pretty cool man yeah. um this is a tough question coming from uh all the people you play with and in particular mule favorite musicians you've enjoyed playing with well, I did Steve Lukather's last record, and that, that was something to sit on. The, that was part of the original plan. <clears throat> it's more like a pipe dream plan, you know, go to the United States and maybe one day play with Jeff Porcaro. He used to be in Little Pipe Dream. I had my early 20s, and the whole session scene had intrigued me, you know, playing on records. And not only that, but that's a part of it. But Jeff passed away, sadly, you know, in 1992, just a year. I saw him at the Baked Potato with the Lost Lobotomies, that band that Luke and uh, sure. he used to do. So I ended up doing a session with um, Luke and Kenny Aronoff for a charity record. Bucks Henderson was a guitar player from uh, Texas. That what's, we, his, what's his first name? Bugs Henderson. Yeah, I know that yeah, he was it was some cancer thing that he was struggling with. I think he passed away after that. But so we ended up in the same room and me and Luke just connected and 
he had stopped drinking. And after I stopped drinking, I called him up and he's like, dude, I'll be your buddy, but I'm no, I'm no AA guy. And I'm like, great. I'm not either. <laughs> I can't, I can't deal with that. I just, I just stopped drinking at, at a certain point, you know, which was probably the best decision I ever made in my life. But leading up to me bugging him, it's like, Hey man, let's put a version of Los Lobotomies back together. And he's like, nah, don't want to do it. And then if few years went and then all of a sudden okay let's do it but we can't call it lost but lost lobotomies so he said let's uh, what do you think about nerve bundle it's like great who should be in the band let's have jeff babco toss panos and me and toss are good good friends close friends and babco too um so we started to do that and that led up to me playing on his record right before the lockdown last yeah. year with David Page on keyboards, and it was all live, but Jeff Babka, Greg Bissonnette. So that was about as close as you could get to my original Jeff yeah. thing, sitting with Toto. Jo Joseph Williams there too in, in the control room. And it was live. I mean, you just pull up a chart and there, rehearse one time and then go. That's how I feel. Um... Lucky, I've had almost all those guys on my show. I can't, this just blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah. David Page, <clears throat> you talked to him? No, but I had Greg, mm -hmm. everybody Greg. except Page. Yeah. Greg is great. Greg on there. Um, and I don't, I just, it's not about me, but I'm just like, you know, these are guys. I'm anyway, I'm just always in awe. Yeah. That was a big thing. I mean, I love that record. It's, I think Luke played exceptional on it. He was really like, "What's the name? What's the name of that record?" I want to listen to it. Yeah, what is it? It's called "I Found the Sun Again." I found the sound again. Sun, yeah. I found the sun again. Cool. I saw, uh, I saw the cover. Yeah, because Joseph released a, a record with a similar cover, kind of like the Kiss solo records. You know, they had the same mugshot. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was so much fun. What's the last thing you listened to recently, musically? Fanny. Fanny the the old band? Girl band, yeah. With uh I'm having a brain fart. Uh, Melancans. Yeah, June. June and Jean. June and Jean, yeah. Yeah, that keyboard, keyboard player. Um I can't think of her name now. She was the, the whole band was amazing. Yeah. yeah, believe it or not, I actually had June on, <laughs> on here. It, it, she was so nice. Yeah, she was really interesting to talk with, man. That and uh, the, what else did I listen to? Uh, no, that was it. That was it. That's that's wild that you happen to listen to it. What made you pick that? That's, that's a YouTube, you know, the sidebar. Oh yeah, okay. And then you go, like, "Fuck, man, this is good." And then you keep going. It's a like, rabbit hole. Yeah. Do you know they pick they they measure, um, based on everything you've done. Their their algorithm is so smart. They, it's very important to them. What comes up next is more important to them than what you're listening to. Mm -hmm. Because they know that if they put the right thing there, you're going to stick. And if you stick, they get to run more ads and their revenue goes up. Right. So they put tons of effort into figuring out that next bar for you, for ever, all of us. So it's very interesting. Uh, do you have a worst gig ever story? I mean, besides um, Saab. <laughs> I think one of the first gigs that I ever did here in the States was we did a cover gig up in Calabasas. Called, it was called Pelican's Retreat, the club. And it was a student band. We went over and then the sound girl at this particular incident, she she did the gig with earplugs in and it was just whistling in the PA, like 10K, just shh, And people were going like, this sounds good, guys. And they left the room and... It, that was probably one of the worst gigs, but it was because I had high hopes for my first gig in LA. Right. Yeah, no, I had some really bad gigs. 
<laughs> the one of the Grove gigs, Grove School of Music gigs, I was playing with uh, John Diversa. And his dad was there, Jay Diversa, trumpet player too. Killer, killer trumpet player and really good teacher. And we were playing take five, I remember. And I got lost in the changes. Dude, tough song. You know, all that. And I saw his dad lay down. <laughs> he was so embarrassed for his son up there playing trumpet. That's hysterical. He actually laid down. Yeah. Wow. And I almost did too. I should have. <laughs> yeah. Give me your uh Jurgen, give me your top three Desert Island discs just for this minute. Right off the top of my head, Royal Scam, Steely Dan, um, Deceptive Benz, 10CC. There's a lot of 10CC records. One of my favorite bands. But um, what do you like about them so much? The, everything. I, the only thing I know of them is that I'm not in love record. Is the rest of their catalog different or is it similar? It's so so vast, broad. The um, okay. there's four, four singers, four songwriters, and they're all arranging and producing, and it's really something else. I mean, okay, I got to take a dive into that now. Then. Yes. Okay. You know, it's kind of sometimes lyrically, and the thing reminds me of Frank Zapp a little bit. There's a humor to it, and uh, all their changes. It's it's remarkable, but it's you know pop music based, but yeah. it's got all the ingredients, anything from jazz to avant garde kind of a thing. I have to check that. What, those like oh the God, Godly and Cream, those those are the only names I know. Yeah, and Graham Goldman and Eric Stewart. Yeah, yeah, that was the other the other pair. Third right. record, you know, uh, maybe best off the Carpenters. Carpenters didn't really have one record that was superb all the way through, I think. But uh, best off would do. So you're like a big pop guy. Yeah. What Absolutely. do you like about pop so much? It's weird because that's not typical of Black Sabbath and Pink Floyd. and I love that shit, too. Yeah, that's not typical. Usually it's like one or the other. It's not both. Yeah. Favorite rock band might be Rainbow, the early Rainbow, yeah. Richard Blackburn and Ronnie James Dio. Ronnie James Dio. Those are great records, man. Those three records just killing me. You know, the songwriting is exceptional. Yeah, it really was. And, and everything with that period of time in general was really cool for music. Yeah. Did you did you listen to rock like that? Or I mean oh, yeah, Rainbow, I have I have all the actual vinyl of Rainbow right out and yeah. yeah. I have the they, rainbow. They vinyl. never really broke through in America. Like it was Deep Purple, but even Deep Purple never really quite mm, early they, Deep Purple. Man. They broke. Th you know what? It was the people that listened to Deep Cuts were very familiar with Deep Purple. You know, and the same thing with Rainbow. Rainbow broke through with, uh, you know, Straight Through the Eyes when that record. Stone Cold. Stone Cold. Yeah. You know, uh, um, after Ronnie. Yeah, Jolene. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, was it Graham Bonnet? Was that who's the singer? Well, Graham Bonnet did one record. Yeah, Jordan, and then Jolene Turner did three records after that. Yeah, and they were big then because they would they played Madison Square Garden. I remember that. Um, but yeah, I I don't I was always really familiar with Rainbow, so I don't. But I never I wasn't like I was the weird kid to listen to. But like Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin is like royalty here. And yeah, Deep Purple is further down in Europe. The, it's equal. It was the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, and then it was Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin. You had, yeah. to, you had to pick a camp. So here it was Beatles and Stones. You had to pick a camp. Right. And I was a Stones guy. And I still That's kind of what I mean, that Deep Purple didn't register as high as Led Zeppelin. Here, yeah, probably not, which is unfortunate because I love both bands. Yeah. I mean, I love, I'm a huge pro. I have all the old Purple uh, vinyl. Yeah, of course. Great, great band, man. I mean, uh, okay. Tell me if you're comfortable, tell me one or two mistakes you made along your journey and what were the lessons or the lesson that you learned from it? Well, mistakes, probably drinking too much. And when you stop, you learn that that was a good thing. Simple as that. When you stop, you learn that stopping is a good thing. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good thing. What was the biggest change that you noticed? It's it's social. Yeah. I didn't really have a problem like medically or physically to stop drinking, but it was it's hard socially, especially coming growing up in Sweden, it's really engraved in the culture. Yeah. You got daytime coffee, afternoon and night, it's just drinks. That's sta- every night. That's standard. But it's the same here too, but really like that in Sweden. It's really yeah. hard to hang out. So socially, the biggest thing was I didn't really hang out. I just did day hangs, lunches and stuff. Right. And you kind of have to find your new identity when you don't have that thing of always having the edge a little rounded. Yeah. I mean, One of the things that I a lot of guys talk about when they quit is that they were terrified like the first show they had to do. Yeah, no, I did feel that. We played Beacon Theater in New York with Mule, and I was sober. I didn't really used to drink before the shows with Mule, but you were always hungover, so you kind of it's a little different thing. And then during the show, you have you have drinks. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, you're you're afraid. You don't dare to suck sober, right? That's yeah. Crazy. And that's the, that, I think that's the key to everything in life. You have to dare to make a mistake and be okay with it. Dare to suck. Yeah. I, I think, right. well, you know, it's interesting. I, my, my, uh, I take guitar lessons and my teacher said to me last lesson we had, he said, listen, he said, you need to play every note like you're on stage, man. He goes, yeah. attack everything. I'm like, you know what? That is fucking really good advice. Yeah. That was my bass teacher, Joel DeBartolo, said that early on at, at Grove. He's like, dude, don't phone it in. I didn't know what that meant at the time, but he's like, make sure everybody hears your mistake and just bow and say, that was me. But that's how you got to perform. You know, yeah. you got to lay it in there and every everything matters. Uh, Not that it really matters. It's just music. But hey. If you're going to do it, might might as well put some effort into it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, by the way. I appreciate that. It was kind of you. Uh, about your drinking. Um, <laughs> t- t- tell me something that you want that you don't have now. Could be something tangible or it could be like a mindset or, you know, whatever you want. Nothing really. I'm pretty content. I mean, I could quad eight mixing console. Any, any government mule fans out there have a <laughs> yeah. Jurgen? You should have this quad eight. <laughs> it's really cheap. That's cool, man. Best decision you ever made? You said was stop drinking. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a hero? Not really. I mean, I have temporary heroes or imaginary figures when I mix. Like I can, when I dial in the bass tone, I can have like a Gene Simmons character standing there and I'm getting the sound and he always goes, nah, it sounds like shit. As a matter of fact, Jorgen, it sounds terrible. It's like really bad. And then I tweak it. And then when I get the tone that I like, the, the imaginary figure disappears or it could be... um there's a singer songwriter called Kevin Gilbert here in LA that was yeah. in band called Toy Matinee. And his songwriting, I could, if I'm writing something, I check in with Kevin or. That's great, man. And he goes, like, dude, it's like really fucking bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but I think that's so good that because because yeah. we all have this power to do that. And that's the way you can change hats in the studio from sitting and playing guitar part and then you mix. You can sort of have these, um, you know, different hats and you have associated with different things. It's still yourself. I mean, it's not like you're ripping ideas off or anything. It's just you're checking with yourself, but it's an imaginary figure, figure, hero-like figure, if you will. But no, yeah, it's a lot easier to check in with, you know, you're mad. hey, what would Gene Simmons tell me in this thing? Well, I, you know, that's a lot easier than saying, how do I make this better? Because now you took the frame of reference off of you. And you can look at somebody else yeah. and that's a lot easier, whatever yeah, you're doing. It could be anybody, Jimmy Johnson on bass or whatever, you mm-hmm. know, it's like. That's really cool, man. How long have you been doing that? Is that just since you stopped drinking or is that? Uh, all my life. 
I do it on stage too. I, I put myself in the audience and I listen to something that I play. And if I, if I can't sing it, I kind of hone it in to make it more melodic. And How, where did you get that from? I don't know. That's a really cool thing. I mean, it's a really helpful thing, a very powerful thing. Yeah. And there's no start to it and there's no end to it. It just appears. And then when you dial it in where you dig it, it kind of disappears by itself. I need to do that more. I do that in business a lot. Like if I was a, advising, a, if I was a consultant on this and I'm advising some, but I need to do that more in my personal life too. I think that's, I'm, I'm, right. I appreciate the reminder. If you had a mentor, you can, what did she or he think, you know? Yeah. That's really good, man. But it's a bit more abstract when I think about it. I don't think about it in, in people, like with a name like that. It's just the, the emotion that I get from that person. Yeah. Is sitting there kind of doing its thing. And then it fades out when it's done and dealt with. Yeah. But that's all you need. You just need whatever you need to get you the, the info you need to get. Right. You know? What makes you happy? Happy. Uh, if I set out to do things and I accomplish them within the time frame, it, it makes me more upset when I don't, I should say. But it, it really makes me feel pretty content if I, oh, I just I got up at nine, I did this and this and that. So you like set go like not like get, you know, you set goals or mini goals for, you know, I, I need to get this. I have an agenda and yeah, just small things, yeah, completely, calls to yeah. um, go to the post office, shit like that. And when I get, yeah. it, cause it irritates the fuck out of me when I don't. And it's just, yeah. up. well, the thing is too, people don't realize is the more you don't do those things, you, the more you're condi you know, uh, accomplishment is a muscle in a sense. And the more you let yourself slide, the more you're telling yourself, Oh, it's okay to slide. So then the next time you're like, well, it's okay to slide. So right. it's a muscle. You got to keep working that sucker, man. I know. I, I'm like and when that. you're producing records and stuff like that, you got to finish it. That's, that's the big one. You know, that's yeah. why most people need a producer, I think, because it's so hard to, to finish it. You always want to, oh, and you get sidetracked and you just got to stay on point. Yeah. it's a good point. Other than that, my son, you know, anything he does makes me happy. That's nice. It's a fucking joy to watch how old is he 17 it'll be 18. oh that's cool yeah very good all right another tough one uh what do you like most about yourself i'm a pretty good listener i hear what would your wife say she likes most about you <laughs> <laughs> food what's that i cook food oh you're a good cook I wouldn't say I'm great, but I, I have some good aspects to it. I'm, you, it's kind of like music, you know, when you, if you make a, uh, I'm a vegetarian now, but if you make mm -hmm. a bolognese or something, it's like you have all the ingredients. It's like mixing. Yeah. So you have to tweak it to so get a good foundation and then have some, some shit on top. Yeah. Cooking's the number one hop, you know, like uh, sort of hobby that musicians have. Fun yeah. Enough. But I think it's very similar. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is happiest moment or happiest time in your life well when my son was born was remarkable i mean that's the given right i don't know i was terrified <laughs> to be honest with you yeah well that after after he was born i was terrified for about six seven years yeah <laughs> no it's a like overwhelming I can see it in pictures. I mean, I don't know if you've seen yourself when you hold your like six month old, you look like a different person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. You're right. You're you, yeah. It's funny. The, the mom just falls into character much quicker. And yeah. maternal is like, so it's an amazing uh, yeah. skill uh, or they just, they're, they're right there, man. They just know how to do that. But you're right. In fact, my daughter was just looking at old pictures of us. My wife said she realizes we're getting old now because all of a sudden she's like, I want to hang out with you guys. We're like, okay. <laughs> so I think she realizes we're getting older or something, which is not good. But uh, yeah, I, I feel you on that, man. Uh, do you have any hobbies outside of music? Not really. 
I've been thinking about it. You know, if I ended up not doing music, maybe do make furniture or something. I was I was joking around about well, cooking food. Dude, you can do like official uh, Swiss furniture. The Americans would gobble that shit up. Yeah, totally. We have special techniques that we use in Sweden, and I'm bringing them here to LA. Just for you. Yeah. Direct, direct <laughs> Sweden. <laughs> What's the favorite place you've traveled, man? You have been all over the world. That's a good one. Um, speaking of Switzerland, maybe I played Montreux Jazz Festival in 1996 with a Swedish band. And I just... I've been back since then, but it struck me like lightning, you know, Lausanne and Montreux and um, Geneva and all that. that. That whole part of the world is pretty remarkable. Really? What was so nice about it? What did you like? Because, I mean, you've literally been all over. Well, you got the Alps for one thing all around you. And then you have villages around this lake, like Geneva. And it's just a really fantastic part of the world. Uh, that's cool. Uh Tell me a talk about an experience that changed your life the size of birth of your son uh, or, or altered the way you think about things. Hmm. Altered the way I think about things. Well, I met this friend in my teenage years, Benny. He was actually a social worker, but he kind of took to me and I took to him and he, he got me started with the, with music seriously and he's like dude you gotta get on this it's happening man you just he like, saw your passion yeah so he he got me on the right track and he started to put like bands together that were we got financial support from the city you know sweden socialistic yeah. it's great it's great and it was he he kind of put me on the right track benny larson uh, let me ask you a question when, so he, he, in a sense, changed your life. Yeah, I would say when stuff like that happens, how do you view it? Do you just view that as right place, right time, uh, higher power, uh, univ like, how do you look at that? If you even give it a thought. Sure. Um, well, I don't think it's a higher power because, what kind of higher power would that be? And, and then leaving the kids in Africa, you know, just to make it short like that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's the right place at the right time. Mm. Yeah. But it's pretty amazing when stuff like that happens, man. It is. When you have that intersection of like, man, if I made a left turn today, I could have been a postman or something like that. Yeah. Now, if you, if you trace your whole music or your whole life story back and it's like, it wasn't even me. It was my friend that met somebody at that coffee shop that gave me that cassette with that song that I thought, oh, that was so good. Right. It's crazy. And then, isn't it? playing with that or working with that person. Yeah, no, it's crazy. But I, yeah, no higher power involved um, ever. You said something else. Uh, I, I've mentioned this guy to you, Christian Carlson. I know there's no relation, but he was in a, is in a band called The Quill over in Sweden. He was telling me that they even give you like rehearsal space. Oh yeah. That's amazing. I mean, that is phenomenal. I mean, that's why there's so many for the size of the population there and the percentage of quality musicianship is amazing. Yeah. Not only do they give you rehearsal space, but that has to be a, an assigned leader, which has to be, gets hired by the, um, whatever you call that, that work group. So you're an assigned leader. And then you make money rehearsing your own band. So you, and then you split that money with the band and you can afford to, you know, rent a car, gas money out to the gigs and stuff like that. So I mean, you get, what an amazing thing. And it's still going on today. I mean, it's re remarkable. There's actually a guy from Sweden calling me. He's tracing down the whole history from my hometown, how it started with nothing in the seventies up till they have a, like a 5,000 seater arena in connection with rehearsal spaces now in that in the city that's so cool i yeah. mean I, it would really be nice to have stuff like that here man 
And that guy, Benny Larson, was a big part of that, <laughs> just to say. Was Benny a musician? No, he was a social worker. Yeah, no, he was a musician too. But he was he started the music house, the first music house in Charlotte, on my hometown. And then it went from there to bigger, 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 bigger things. So um two more questions man you're an easy guy to talk to man do you get angry or is this like are you not normally like this or are you just like laid back this minute i'm pretty laid back but i mean i, I lose my temper do you really sure i've broken a few bases fretless bases <laughs> <laughs> like you particularly pick the fretless ones if i got to break a base and they break a fretless but when i first started recording on that half inch tascam analog 16 track machine I was at the end of the song and like, do we do do do? You know, fretless is pretty hard. You got to get the intonation. Really hard. And, and then you punch, and all of a sudden you lose track and you start to work backwards. And then you're almost at the first verse again oh. because you fuck up the punches. God. You know, yeah, you had this pedal. So, so yeah, I can lose my temper. Trust me. It's, uh, uh, I work on it. It's t is it, you have to push you though. I mean, you're like very laid back. You've seen, like, in a very good way. Low blood, do you have low blood, low blood pressure? Uh, since I stopped drinking, yeah, I bet, man. Shit. Yeah. Uh, last two, two questions. Uh, and thank you for everything, man. You've been like a real nice to talk with. Um, and thanks for being so open. Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years, and how much of that has been intentional, and how much is just a part of aging? Well, it's connected with the drinking no drinking and the fact that i do what we're doing today like an interview like this i wouldn't never done that five years ago unless it was truly business i had to promote a record or something right i stay out of this i do it as a training now social training for myself like all right fuck it we're, we're conducting an experiment <laughs> <laughs> Let me know the results. <laughs> I I put it in my write-up. Um, that's cool. And uh, most important lesson that you've learned, life has taught you. Oh, don't pretend you know something you don't. Ask questions. Yeah, that's important. Sometimes people feel they got to know everything. And it's, it's a lot of pressure for that. Yeah. And if you ask questions, you notice that people are more than happy to answer. Oh, yes. Well, this is how that works. Yeah. Don't have to be embarrassed. Hell no. Uh, let me tell people, you got a bunch of stuff going on. I just want to make people aware of this. First of all, there's a new Government Mule album coming out. By the time this interview drops, it'll be out. It's called Heavy Load. Um, Little Days is touring next year, you said? We are planning a tour in March uh, up on the Northeast Coast. And it's going to be with another band that I'm working uh, a new project with Shane Terry on guitar and Toss Panos on drums. And the idea is we're going to do that trio. It's called Le Combo. We actually did a session yesterday. Le Combo. Yeah. It's, it's some uh, skanky, badass rock and roll. And so we use the same cast in Little Days and add Meanie and Bernie Barlow on background vocals. So we're going to try to do a tour with both the same personnel, but play two sets of different music. That's cool. Where is that going to be posted? I don't know. I'm not the media. I know. It'll be probably on Instagram and um, hopefully some other people in, in the band have the, uh, you know, the uh, Facebooks and the uh, Instagram stuff. Well, too, you know what? There's a go to littledays.net and there's a sign up at the bottom. I don't know if somebody monitors that email list, but if there oh, yeah. is, and you guys yeah. tour, yeah. So go to littledays.net. There's an email list at the bottom there and on the homepage, I think, and you can uh, they'll give you updates. But I would check out the really cool bands, very fun. And again, your wife's voice is amazing. Uh, also, also, um, talk about. I, I had to beat this out of him, so. Uh, this is on me. Talk about production. I know you like doing it. You got a great analog studio there and I know you've worked hard and you're proud of it. So tell me about it. Well, it's sort of a hybrid thing. You know, I was lucky picked up a, a Studer 820, 24, 24 track um, tape machine. And so usually I usually I say we, I'll go back to when I worked with Steve Holroyd there, but 
I, I do basic tracking on that bass and drums and keyboards, bass, and drums, and guitar. And then I do a bunch of overdubs and then that goes into Pro Tools in high resolution. And then it gets mixed analog to a quarter inch MCI machine. Right on. And it's just, I don't know what it is. I just prefer the sound. I can get a decent sound just working in the box with, with digital stuff. But every time I open it up, it just seems to work for me better. You know, I'm not saying it's one way to do things. It's uh, no, it's what you like to do. Yeah, but as far as editing, digital is unbeatable. So it, it you know, there's never any budgets to do pre-production anymore. So you kind of have to do post-production. Yeah, if you will. You you record a bunch of shit and then you you can edit it and cut it in a little bit in Pro Tools. But I prefer recording without click tracks as well. So all the edits are done without click. Same with Government Mule. We, we never record with click tracks. Some pop music benefits a little bit from having a, you know. But um, yeah, the studios, um, I like old shit, but most people do, right? Yeah. Is it still called Roger's Boat Studio, even though uh, yeah. Stephen? Mm -hmm. All right. So if you are interested in working with Jurgen in a production or engineering capacity, uh, on the uh, little days, there's a, an email. It's little days music at gmail.com. Um, he's got a pretty full schedule. So send him like links to the music. What are you looking for? Why do you think he'd be a fit for you? And how do you think he could best serve you? And then he can make a decision and get back to you intelligently based on the information you've given him. And also same thing, if you're looking for him to play on your tracks and music, what are you looking for? And you can email all that to little days, music at gmail.com. That was painless, right? Yeah. All right. Good. Uh, thank you. Um, anything else, man, you'll be up the, is mule touring next year? Yeah. Yeah. We're, touring um summertime late march i think it's nothing concrete yet but i've seen the um, preliminary schedules cool then in may you know it'll probably be summer you know okay. when we did the the recording of the last records we actually recorded two records at the same time we did one blues record as we call it which was no headphones everybody in the same live vocal and we were just sitting in really really close to each other and then john paterna was co-producing and engineering that and at the same time we had set up like more traditional close mic and on headphones and we did the the regular mule record which is not out yet but that probably will come out at some point next year mm. and so yeah there'll be a lot of government mule touring that's awesome i hope you guys come down here man we were I just saw... in tampa oh yeah for the uh yeah it was like a festival or something no it was it was a it was a hot sticky mess when you were here too wasn't it yeah it was yeah uh and you know what i've seen you a couple of times at janice they always oversell and it's like so gross there man because you know they got a bunch of hillbillies here walking around spilling beer all over you and you know uh but i did see you and it might have been even before you in the band you, did you play the tampa theater i don't remember yeah, it was a while back. 2008 um, is when I joined. Right, I know. I think I don't know. It was either seven or eight. Um, and of course, I've seen the Beacon a couple of times. Um, man, thank you for everything. I really appreciate it. And uh, it was really nice talking to you. Yeah, likewise. You lived up to the hype. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. You did, man. Hang on. Let me wrap this up and then we'll talk. Thanks for everything. You're going to appreciate it. You got it. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, share it on your social media networks. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Jurgen Carlson. Again, uh, Government Mules coming out, heavy load. Uh, check out Little Days. Uh, go sign up at the littledays.net. It's a really cool band they'll be touring with. His other band, Le Combo, in the Northeast. And if you're interested in working with Jurgen on tracks or production in his analog studio, email him at littledaysmusic at gmail.com. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar or your bass, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Thanks for everything, brother.